Okay, today on Time Out Coaching, we have a rising star and also one of the most dynamic young coaches in the UK. He is regarded as one of the top individual skills instructors working with a variety of players at every level. I'm pleased to welcome Coach Gary Maitland. Coach, How are you? How are you doing on? good evening. Um, really appreciate it. I know you're extremely busy, even in the um this pandemic or whatever we're in at this precise moment um i really have wanted to to have you on uh the series for a long while because i think you you have a unique um outlook in how you coach um you know you really have taken the teaching of individual skills to really at such a high level and also in such a different way um and i'm not sure that the even the British coaching public really understand that. So really want to, di to, to dive into that um, with a number of kind of questions. So um, I'm excited by, you know, starting, but as usual, um, love to, to find out your background, um, you know, how you got involved in basketball, where you got the love from, and then how that translated into, uh, into coaching and uh, developing um, players. Yeah um okay so back when i got into playing um 92 olympics that, that was it it was you know the luck of having the olympics in europe so the time zones virtually the same which meant all the sports are on tv at, at a reasonable hour and you know i'm like you know 11 years old and i'm seeing the dream team do some phenomenal phenomenal things like you know i, I just hadn't seen that before so I can remember, you know, it was the summer holidays. I think we were on a family holiday and I'm seeing it on the TV. Like my parents just love sport, love the Olympics, anything like world, you know, world kind of competition. And, um, and that's it. I'm copying like the no look passes. I've got my tongue out like Jordan. And, and that was it. That was it. I was like, I need to know more. I want to know more. And uh, conveniently, that's at an age where I'm just about to get into secondary school. So now all of a sudden we're like, traditionally in this country that's where most people have their first experience with basketball unfortunately um so now i'm around older players luckily i'm in like a, a london school no fields there's no grass anywhere in our school so that's it like there's no rugby football's not that popular cricket uh they're playing on the playground knocking balls against bins but the basketball courts were thriving and that was me i was like you know and it was just like that kind of like domino effect of Here's the Olympics. I'm now going into a school where basketball is the only outlet, you know, for, for social time. And, uh, and, that, and, that, and that got it rolling. Now, it, interestingly, the way the stars aligned is our, our, in the changing room of our, of our, our boys' changing room in the school, uh, the PE teachers had a list on the notice board of all the local clubs of all the sports. So guess whose name was pinned on that notice board? Your name. My name yeah. Your name and number. My name was was pinned on there and uh and I, i'll never forget like I, I got home i took the number down um you know this would have been what year nine so like 13 years old um and i called 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 the number and, it, and, it, and it's you and it's you so you know I, you know you go down in my stories as like my first my first coach um and it's, it's crazy how appreciative i am now of that history because that's such a, an incredible starting point to, to structured basketball that you happen to be local and i know you've got your own story to why you were yeah were local so um, so we we better tell the story very quickly but um you know london towers were based uh, at wembley and um we obviously still had the extremely successful junior program which was running in hackney um but i wanted to prove and you know most people that know me know the story that i wanted to prove that you could win with any group of players um in any part of london that was my basic premise that you could win a national championship um picking a group of kids that had never played basketball in a different part of london so you know, I to back that up, I had to do something. And I said, right, we're going to find, form this little team in Northwest London. Um, and, you know, basically ba base it out of, uh, well, we based it in the top part of Brent, didn't we? I'm, 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 yeah. I'm trying to remember the, some of the places that we actually practiced that. 
Um, school, one of them. Yeah, school, yeah. And it's Wembley actually, High School, yeah. Yeah, Wembley High School, that's right. And so we had those two schools and those two places, and we had a kind of a two-year kind of program that first year. I think we got to the finals. Actually, if I'm not mistaken, um, James Veer on, on that one of those early podcasts called us out for losing uh, for losing <laughs> against him. So, uh, And then the year after, um, we won the national championship. Um, I think we had Olu playing uh, with yeah. us as well. So, I mean, yeah. Yeah, it's, it is an incredible um, stroke of fortune because, to be honest with you, we could have—I could have just stayed we, with Joe, and we could have Joe could have just been doing under 15s and everything else that he did. And um, but I decided to do that. And you will probably—I mean, almost certainly—the biggest success of out of that team, um, both you know from your playing and what you've you've achieved. But there were some some really good players that came from that team, and um, you know some misses, but there were some really good players that were on that program. Yeah, and, and little did I know, you know, from calling you, you know, blind calling you with that number on the on the notice board that, you know, the, the, the bigger picture of, okay, after, you know, I've experienced a couple of years with you, then it was like, okay, then it was the, the handover to Joe White, yeah. you know, and I had no idea of, of what was going on. I was just like riding the waves, you know, yeah. um, and, and again, I'm going from yourself, you know, and I can remember the drills I can remember the detail on the footwork I can remember you know those those small micro skills um, that we would religiously go through that then made life a hell of a lot easier when I get to Joe and all of a sudden like it's there's there's a lot of mind games going on you know like Joe's throwing in all kinds of things he's expecting us to think and it was it was such a you know such an amazing you know environment to be in where you know he taught us to be you know, very independent, but working together as well, you know, um, so, you know, the, 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 the chain there was, was awesome and really set me up for what, what took me to then national team. And, you know, I, I played for um, Rick Woolridge and Chris Morgan on the national team. Just really quickly, um, what was your London Towers um, junior team? Um, that just name some players that were on that team. Um, and obviously we're referencing Joe White, you know, uh, the, the, the legend that is, um, just in case people didn't understand that, but, uh, yeah. Okay. What, who was on, the, who was on the, the team, your team, your teams at that time? So my age group for the 81s, um, was Olu Babalola. Um, we had, uh, Mus and Kieran. Um, they were also the guards with us. Um, we had... Dwayne Saleh, who actually came from Hastings. He was also on, on the England team as well. Uh, Paul Crawford actually moved to us from um, East London Royals. The Crawfords are obviously, you know, big, big basketball family and JJ is now in the NFL. Um, uh, so those were like the, the 81s. And then the year group above, um, obviously Drew Sullivan was, was the year above me. Um, we had uh, Grant Banja, Wale, and the crazy thing is, is I'll name these names, and a lot of these guys didn't go on to the college level, to the pro level, but man, like at junior level, yeah, like were, killers. Yeah. I mean, thoroughbreds. Yeah. You know, it, it was it was such a. I mean, if social media was around, I sound really old now, but <laughs> I mean, if social media was around those days, what a, what a time to document what was going on. Yeah, you know? absolutely. I, I tell that uh, I have a conversation with this uh, about that with a number of the players, you know, like Justin Robinson and even like Junior Williams, Mike Bernard. Um, can you just imagine if social media had been been around in, in, in those days where, you know, like when you know, just just uh, just the other day he was talking about the um, actually to Mansoor about the the unbelievable game that Drew Sullivan and Aju Deng played, you know, for the oh, national, rough and national ready. final. Yeah. Well, rough and ready, oh, oh. but also yeah, yeah, yeah. A, a national cup final in Birmingham. And, um, you know, those are, those, if those, those were ever put on national, on social media now, people really understand, you know, why, why I don't get as excited about some of the play that I see at that level. So anyway, that's another story. Um, let's talk. So you went on to, you made the national team. There's two, two great coaches you're talking about, Rick Warridge and, and Chris Morgan. Um, who else was on that national team? And just talk quickly about the experience of, of Rick and, and Chris. Yeah. So other players, um, uh, again, Paul Crawford, who was a teammate at Towers, he was on that team. 
um, we had a very kind of ahead of his time guard from Brixton, Marlon Douglas, he was around. Um, we had Chris Jeremiah, who was wow. easily one of the best junior players, you know, at the time. Um, we had uh, David Aliu from Liverpool. Um, he was on that team as well. It's funny, we actually, when we went to the, the European competition um, in Italy, we played against Russia and, uh, you know, Kirilenko was on the score sheet. You know, we didn't realise we were playing against a future NBA star, but we got our butts whooped, man. That was a learning experience, to say the least. Yeah. Um, but, but playing for, you know, Rick um, and Chris, and, and Humph was always around as well. I mean, I, I don't know what his role was, but I mean, he, there is a role. I, I think he was actually, at that t- time, he was actually kind of like chef de mission or like a team leader, that type of, yeah. um, basically he was kind of like the, 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 you know, kind of a, what you would probably call now uh, like technical director kind of thing. That would what right. be his role kind of now. It didn't have a role, didn't have a name at that time, but I remember yeah. that. You know, vividly. Yeah, so so that was, I mean, I, I love playing for those guys. It was different though. It was very different. You know, their philosophy was very different to to to, to your style, to Joe White's style. Um, and, um, and that really paid off for me in the end because it just made me more knowledgeable, made me more aware of a different way of playing you know, I remember at the time, like they had us, um, you know, forced on defense, they had us force in middle, which was very different to what, you know, I'd obviously learned at club level. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it really opened my eyes to a different way of teaching and different way of coaching. And, and um, I really, really enjoyed the experiences with the national team. And then uh, from there, um, talk about how you got to go to America and, you know, that, that, that whole part of your life there. Yeah, huge part huge part of my life I'm, a, I'm an advocate for for players leaving if they need you know whether it be playing or life experiences like for sure i'm a big advocate for that so so yeah i mean like most people um of that generation and and now we start to look east well we looked west um you know now we're looking a bit more east but surely we looked west we're like right who's gonna go where are we gonna go and all this kind of thing and again fortunately that you had developed a number of contacts you know, over the years, uh, we played in the national final against, um, well, we beat, uh, I can't remember who we beat Sammy, we played Birmingham in the finals sure. um, and won that. And um, one of the, uh, we had a coach, a high school coach from North Louisiana and uh, Dr. Tim Murphy, um, who was like a, a sponsor kind of role, um, a chiropractor from the yeah. South. Um, he was in attendance and, um, and I don't know what the backstory was, the conversations that you and Joe had with them, but um, they spoke to me afterwards. And all of a sudden now this becomes a real conversation that I could be, I mean, this is the end of the season, right? So we're talking about May. I could be leaving in a couple of months, <laughs> yeah. you know? And, 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 and again, going back to a time where there was no social media, yeah, we know that players are going abroad, but there's no real kind of, understanding of what's happening or visual representation of what's going on so you know we're talking about yeah we'd like to go we'd like to go and all of a sudden it became real so yeah I left in August that year so that would have been 98 um went to the went to the went to the dirty south I went to Mississippi which was a, an extreme culture shock to say the least um but you know my years in the U.S. were easily some of the best years of my life I mean I I learned how to come out of my shell. I became more independent. Um, I landed, and it's, I mean, it's awesome when I think about it. Like, again, that journey of, of playing and experiencing some high-level coaches at every single step. Right. So my first coach um, was Jay Ladner, who is now at Southern Miss. Um, and and little did I know, you know, what his path was going to be. Sure, you know? sure, so yeah. the knowledge I'm getting from him was, was, was phenomenal, you know? Yeah. And I'm taking this for granted in the moment, you know, sure, yeah. the assistant coach uh, was Errol Goff, who um, he, I actually transferred and went to his school. So he left and I actually went to his school, but he ended up coaching D1, uh, college D1 uh, women's. So again, another coach, you know, who's, who's, you know, was on his path to, to greater success. Sure. Um, you know, so awesome, awesome guys that taught me a lot about the game. And, and and just all of these experiences in college um, and all of the stuff that you learned in America, 
are you is there anything in your mind about you know like i can transfer this eventually you know into coaching because you were always a good thinker of the game you were really you know you you, you were a student um you you thought about the game did you ever think oh you were just like you said you were in the moment you would just play play you know i'm gonna play to the highest level I, my goal is to get to this level was that was that the main out main situation there that was it it was it was yeah i was i was never looking too far ahead i didn't know how to look too far ahead right it was always i'm playing what am i going to do next where am i going to go next and and i actually wasn't that well informed i mean I was, in hindsight i was really foolish you know like i land on an american soil and i'm thinking about how am i going to be able to play for like michigan you know yeah. and north yeah. carolina like that's you know that's me i'm like how am i going to do that sure. you know and, and and i just wasn't i wasn't at that level right now interestingly you know, I was I was producing at the level that I was playing at. I mean, well, we were just 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 before you say that though, would that would have that been because you know, don't forget at that time, you know, and not just it just happened to be our own players, but there were some other British players as well. But you you know, like you're looking at um, Andrew Sullivan, he's a villain over, and and Olu's going to Clemson. So maybe you just feel thought at that moment that uh, hey, I'm next. I'm going to one of those places as well. Maybe. For sure, for sure, for sure. I think, and, and it's a tough comparison, right? Because here are my peers who are moving on to some big time schools, sure. right? And I mean, I, there's, I mean, I wasn't lacking in confidence. I knew I could compete. You know, I, I fitted in, like without a doubt. Like I fitted in with these guys. But when you're talking about, you know, Drews, your Olus, I mean, these guys have physical bodies that I, it doesn't matter how hard I work, I'm not getting that. No, no. you know. So, and I didn't appreciate how difficult it is for a guard to, to really make a name for himself, you know, and at the age that I was going out there, again, without real, you know, exposure, no social media to promote myself, you know, I didn't know the importance of attending AAU tournaments or these summer camps. I didn't get it. I just thought somehow they would find me. Um, I was in a, you know, I was in a bit of a situation. I was like, right, what do I do next? So, I got what I wanted in a sense. So I actually walked on for a division one college, Southeastern Louisiana. So I went to try out and in another interesting story, bouncing from one great coach to the next, who do I walk into the gym? And it's, it's Billy Kennedy, right? Wow. Who, who obviously then went on to like Texas A&M sure. um, and he was at Murray state before that. So again, I'm, I'm walking into people's lives who know the game and know how to teach it, sure. but didn't appreciate the time. Um, and even Steve Prone, um is what well, his assistant wow. Wow. you know and, and, and again it, it's 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 crazy that this was happening and i didn't really understand it wow. but here i am walking on to a division one program and i'm like yeah I can, I can play and there's a lot of politics when you're when you're in that environment as a walk-on because the coach is obviously loyal to the guys who have scholarships and once they want to get their return out of the investment they've made. Sure. But I was, I was killing guys in practice, yeah, you know, yeah. like the pick and roll was getting a bit more popular at that time. And I, I'll never forget, we, we, we're going through, you know, a two on two pick and roll. We're looking at the different reads and I'm killing the starting guard. And, and, and coach Kennedy, you know, is blowing up that moment. Yeah. He's like, hey, when everyone pick and roll, like I'm putting you in the game, I'm putting you in the game, you know? So I'm starting to feel a little bit more confident, but then I don't get to travel. You know, I'm doing, I'm going to study hall, I'm lifting weights, I'm attending practices, but I don't get to travel with the team. And that's when I took a bit of a, a hit mentally. Um, and I was like, right, what do I need to do next? You know? Right. Um, and I guess that's when my playing started to take a little bit of a dip. Um, so I, I moved to New York. My girlfriend at the time was living in New York. Again, in the South, no family, no nothing like that. You know, I felt a little bit isolated. Um, so I went there and thought, right, let me go and play at the local college there, work my way up. Who knows? Get no noticed at Hofstra, who, who, which is also in Long Island. Sure. So I thought, let me let me try and play my cards. Anyway, cut long story short, I was like, I need to go home now. I, my, my eldest son was about to be born. And I was like, right, my priorities need to change here. Um, there's no way I'm going to jeopardize, you know, his upbringing just because I want to play. Sure basketball you know I thought let me try and do this a little bit different so I came home um but still had the itch to play um so I actually reached out to uh, in fact Bob Banya the referee right. saw me saw me play and was like whoa, whoa 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 you're telling me you're not playing you know pro level and I'm like nah and he's like right hold on a minute so he called up Vince McCauley <laughs> right 
and got me down to Milton Keynes. Wow. Um, so I showed up at Milton Keynes um, for a couple of practices. So Drew Spinks is there. Nigel's player Nigel's coach. Still, yeah, Nigel's player coach. Uh, yeah. 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 And, um, but Tony, my ego got in the way a little bit. And I'll tell you why. Because here I am going from the US, right? The high school system big on basketball, big basketball school, big basketball town. I then go and play at a division one college. I'm getting team managers washing my clothes with, you know, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's a professional environment, you know, yeah. and then I show up in uh, Kings, a cold, yeah, I've literally in a cold, dusty gym and I'm just not feeling it. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's flattening or it was flattening. Sure. Right. And that's no disrespect to the guys. It just, that's what is what it, you know, it was what yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. absolutely. Um, so, so weirdly enough, it's the same era where street ball started to take off and I wanted a bit of fun. I wanted a bit of fun. And that's where I turned to, which is weird now, because while I enjoyed the, the gimmicks and the Mickey Mouse stuff around that, sure. it just allowed me to enjoy the game a little bit more. Um, but it was that, it was that, it was that moment when I was like, right, I want to stay close to the game. I'm, I'm seeing how other coaches are coaching. And I'm like, I, I want to have a go at that, you know. So I actually started playing for London United um, under Jack. Um, and uh, so Pete Depish was on that team. Steve Veer was on that team. Waleed Mamouni was on that team. Um, and yeah, we had, I mean, we had a strong group. But that was when I was like, I want to keep playing. But, oh, coaching is quite interesting. And that's, and that's I would say, the turning point where I'm like, right, I want to, I want to give that a go. And, and at that time, you know, career-wise, um, how did you how did you make the decision to go into education and end up at the school, um, you know, teaching and then start, you know, really your proper coaching career? So weirdly enough, um, London United were having, um, I mean, they had their community coaches that were sure. here, there, and everywhere, right? Well, funny enough, the school that had your number on the notice board right. is, the same, is the same school where they were having practice right down the road from my parents' house. Right. Oh, so it was a no brainer. I'm like, okay, let me go. And, and this is when London, United, this was London United's first year. So they had just formed as London United. Wow. Um, they were before they were North London. Uh, I can't remember. Anyway, Dave yeah. Schiller's, Dave Schiller's group and Jack kind of came together. So, um, just conven geographical convenience. I was like, okay, I want to go here. Yes, I want to do some coaching. So Dave and Jack got me in doing some community coaching. I was going to this primary school, this high school, moving all over the place. And I was like, okay, this is cool. I'm earning some money here, but there's no, I, I, it lacks purpose as far as I'm concerned. I was like, how on, how on earth am I going to develop players? Seeing them once a week, twice a week. It just, oh. it's not going to happen. And I've experienced the daily stuff in the US. So right. I'm like, I know I've seen this model work. Yeah. You know, I improved a lot. I felt the improvements. I saw the improvements. So I wanted to bring that um, to my local, you know, my local community. Sure. So, um, so some of my, my, my same, the same PE teacher that taught me <laughs> right. was still there. You know, in fact, there were two of them, you know, Andy Charles and Steve Campbell were still there. Um, and, and then they got me in. They were like, do you think you could speak to some of our younger kids in assembly, tell them about your, you know, your story, your journey, blah, blah. And then boom, I was like, I feel so comfortable speaking in public. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm really comfortable doing this. They noticed that, you know, the kids were silent when I was talking. So then they were like, look, do you think you could mentor a couple of kids, you know, because they're not doing so good, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, yeah, no problem. And then before you know it, I'm now coaching the, the school basketball team. Right. I'm, I'm doing mornings, I'm doing afternoons, you name it. And I'm bringing the daily, the daily contact sure. um, that I've learned from the U S and I'm, and I'm putting it into, into, into this school. Um, and, and that's where I started to realize the impact that I could have if I can touch the lives of these kids every single day. Right. Um, so one of my first players. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. You're one of your so first players. One of my first players was Kenroy Wood. And Kenroy Wood, as a junior player, was arguably of his generation, phenomenal. 
you yeah. know, was by, I mean, that's, uh, Ken Roy's unfortunately, you know, I mean, there are a number of them, but he was definitely a miss to, um, British basketball. I mean, he was incredible. I remember that. Remember you introducing me to him and yeah, I was, that was a next level player, a real next level player body yeah. and but, everything. So, yeah, exactly. And so having meeting Ken Roy as an 11 year old and then working with him every single day, I mean, I could see the results and, 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 and the school could see it, you know, because they could see that the team were now having a positive contribution in school. And, and I realized, okay, this is where I need to be. I need to be in a school where, you know, whatever, I don't care what I do during the day. You can get me doing anything you want, right? right. I'm looking forward to before school and after school. That's why I'm there. You know, yeah. I don't care what you, what you get me doing before, you know, during the day. What, what, what years were, was, were, were, were we talking about now? What was the year? Year, year seven to year eleven. So and what, just sorry, what? Before. Yeah, what time? Sorry, time the the time frame. Sorry, what what, what was it? Two twenty? Oh, was it? Oh, sorry, is, yeah, two thousand and sorry, two thousand and three, two thousand and yeah, two thousand and two, two thousand and three, um, and the school gave me the fir my first full time contract, two thousand and four, right, um, and and that's when I was like, okay, I'm here every day, like, okay. I'm gonna, you know, I'm, I'm gonna make something special here, you know. And and so this this, I mean, in between 2004 and let's say for argument's sake around, you know, 2015, that type of time, you know, almost like a 10, 11 year period. Are you are you like in your mind? Are you? I just want to coach this kind of scenario this morning and afternoon. I want to develop my own local kind of team. Or are you starting to think that there's more to, you know, more to coaching than, than just doing it that way? I was, I was, I was really in the moment. You know, I, I think I, I, I didn't see myself, I didn't see myself beyond this, this point. Right. I just wanted to, I just, I, I knew where I was at and I was like, everything I'm going to do is going to improve where I'm at. I didn't even think about career. I didn't even think about, okay, where am I going to go next? Sure. Who am I going to work with next? All I thought about was how am I going to get these players playing at a high level package them up and then send them wherever they need to go. You sure. know, that I, I really saw that as my purpose. I was like, okay, winning games is great, but I want them to go and experience something better after we've, you know, after we've done our bit. Yeah. That was, that, that was it. And I, and it, it took me a while to figure that out. Sure. But what helped, helped figure that out for me was um, I moved to, well, we didn't go into six form. We didn't touch six form because that would dilute everything. Right. It would mean it would mean, you know, the younger players would have less contact um, on the court. It meant that I would be more thinly spread. And I was like, I'm not doing that. Like, I'm not doing that. Right. I'm just going to have to say, all right, at the age of 16, I'm just going to help you get to wherever you need to go. Sure. Sure. And it's at an exciting time for British basketball because it's when the academy started to form that I then shipped them off. I mean, Kenroy then went to Barkin. Um, and, and then after that, we had a series of players that come through that are now playing at, you know, serious levels. I mean, if we take the 96 borns, we've got D'Lo, you know, he came, he came over to us and, you know, he went from being, um, you know, he was on the England under 15s program. I mean, he's pretty much represented every national team at every age group sure. along the way. So seeing his journey was like, right at the end, I remember saying to his parents, I was like, I would love for him to stay at sixth form, right. but, but that would be selfish. I mean, yeah, that would be sure. for me and not for him. Yeah. So I was like, right, where are we going to go? And he'd, he'd built such a, a strong relationship with Andreas because Andreas was his under 16s uh, national team head coach. Man, go to Bristol. Right. You know, that's how I didn't never, I never knew the story of how he ended up there. That's right. Okay. Yeah. It's fine. So, and who else so was in, who, what, who else was in the 96 group? So Eustace uh, Muzikavichus was a Lithuanian um, British passport holder. I uh, played on the national team as well. So at 15, 16, we're talking about 6'8", six, 6'9", six, um, could shoot the three. I mean, he was really, really good at that level. Um, he then decided not to go. So he was going to go to Bristol too, but right. he decided that he was going to go to Lithuania um, to play. Um, now, you know, his career then, I guess, slowed down. Sure maybe absolutely no reason to do with moving to Lithuania at all, but for whatever reason, no, uh, it, didn't, it just didn't take off, you know, the way that maybe it could have if he went somewhere else. Um, but they really set the tone, you know, we're going from, from Kenroy 
now to Dwayne, and then you'd never believe who was younger than that. So we've got Nelson, Ocha Yeardom, who's now at Davidson. We've got Kane, Henry McCaller, who's now at Jackson State. Um, Session Russell, um, who's now at Florida Tech uh, with Billy Mims. Um, and uh, we've got Louis Norton Cuffey, again, who was a, a GB player under 16 level, who's now over in the US. And we've got all these players. Um, and I'm naming, and I'm naming those who have gone on to uh, recognizable sure, programs. Sure, yeah, yeah. At the time, I mean, I could name you Carney Marius, fantastic guard. Uh, Joseph Norman, again, fantastic, you know, shooting guard. That at that Warren Parkinson, you know, they're phenomenal players at that young age group. Um, who, who really lifted that program and turned it into something special. So, uh, you know, you're saying that um, post-16, you didn't, you know, you didn't want to dilute the product and you wanted to move them on. Um, was there anything in your mind around, you know, like you say, around the 2013-14 type mar mark where the academy start, structure started kind of really blossoming in, um, that you would start, you would try to establish your own academy um, and and build a build a structure that way because it's still at that time. If you think there was Hackney, there was there was uh, Barking Abbey in the east, um, but it wasn't really a representation in the west of London at that time. There was Jack's Academy, I guess. Um, you know that more even more west, um, yeah. but northwest London there wasn't anything until actually now with with Harringay. So, what yeah. was your what was your mindset with regards to that? So I think I'd really set up a culture of you get into school at 11 years old and all of a sudden we're going through talent ID. You know, I'm trying to identify who are the basketball players who are willing to commit themselves on a daily basis, who's willing to wake up in the morning, you know, all of these things. Um, and, I, and I felt that that was really, really important, not just on a basketball level, but on a, on, on a student level, on a human level, you know, yeah. and uh, so for me, if I had to, if I was then going to go to sixth form and do the 16 to 19, it would have compromised my attention to them. And the school wasn't in a position, the school wasn't really in a position to employ, you know, another coach or, mm. you know, other staff. So I knew I was on my own doing this. And I yeah. thought, let, let's not try and complicate things, right? right. Let's, yeah. be, let's be really, really simple with this. Like, I'm going to take this age group and and I'm just going to help them move to wherever they need to go next. And and, that, and literally that was it. That's a really interesting. I mean, that's a. I've I've actually talked to some of the academy coaches who who actually do believe that there needs to be a set of that section before you know 11 to 16 needs to be really identified and worked on much much more heavily because when they get the kids at 16 years old a lot of them don't have the core skill component or even understanding of the game so um in that period of between let's say 2004 for argument's sake and 2014 um was there any coaches that were that you were being influenced by were you going back to america um you know were you thinking about coaching clinics and trying to get more more you know more more drills more more understanding of the game what was yeah. your what was your what was your drive at that time to to get better as a coach yeah um okay so Loved clinics, loved coaching clinics, um, loved, you know, getting my level three. So, um, I, okay, so if we take it back to 2004, I'd say between 2004 and maybe 2006, um, I would say Branny Bazzani was my mentor. Wow. Uh, awesome. We would communicate almost daily. Um, he would, I had him in coming in to, to do some sessions with the boys um and i mean he would bring his laptop and he just i mean he'd sit down on the desk and like scroll through you know his his uh catalog of drills and he'd, he'd you know i'd be standing behind him he'd be scrolling and he'd have this you know s like smug look on his face look at me and say look 300 drills 300 yes. you know yeah, and um yeah. i mean he, he he gave me a lot of tools to work with so branny was a, a huge influence uh, in my early days of being a coach um right. without doubt um, before he moved, he, 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 he left the, the country. Sure. Um, and um, so where did it go next? Well, I definitely looked west. I, I looked to the US. Um, so uh, I actually flew to um, 
to Holland to see Bobby Knight. Um, I was I was I was I was really intrigued by by him, um, you know, and, and how he and how he teaches the game. That I wanted to see him in real life. So um, fortunately, the school helped me out with that and, and and put me on a plane to go and see him. And we stayed at the same hotel, so I actually got to sit down in the bar and That's talk to cool. Bobby Knight, which was yeah next level stuff. Yeah, I mean, that was totally. a, a yeah. great experience. So I'd say I definitely looked west at the the, the more senior coaches in the US um for inspiration and then all of a sudden you know this is aligning up now with youtube right, right. and and i'm like i want to i want to know how to put some stuff on youtube i want to learn how to do this because i'm looking up drills i'm looking up things and i'm like i'm i'm liking what i see i'm not liking what i see sure and now i'm like i want to share it like if you can do it i can do it yeah. so i learned how to cut film and make my own stuff and um, you know, music was quite a big thing growing up for me. So I learned how to produce. So I started producing my own music for it. And, and I got quite involved in learning, you know, at, yeah. you know, in that era. Um, and that's what then led me to more um, skill development stuff. Right. And, and when I started sharing more about what we're doing at Harrow High, and bearing in mind, you know, we had, talk about inspiration. I mean, I, I spent a day at, at Barking Abbey. You know, I reached out to Lloyd and I was interested in seeing what they do. Sure. Um, so I took some really like, you know, powerful elements that they have there. And I was like, what can I do at Harrow High with it? So we had an EABL week right. for 11 to 16 year olds. Right. Sure. Yeah. yeah, you know, yeah, the, the, yeah. the amount of hours that they had for basketball yeah. was insane. I mean, we had team practice. We had individual workouts or small group workouts during the day which the head teacher allowed us to have sure. it was i mean it was awesome so that allowed me to experiment a little bit and that's when i was like oh i'm enjoying the skill stuff you what know I like i love the tactical the tactical but i'm like how am i how can i expect them to execute it if they don't have the individual skills that's going to allow them to access the tactics, you know, and it's a bit of a chicken and the egg, isn't it? But, no, absolutely. But, no, yeah. it's not a chicken and an egg. It is the individual skills yeah. are the cornerstone. They're, they're a bedrock of what a skill to, of, of playing our game, you know, yeah. without those skills, you know, the, the, the tactics of, you know, can be broken. Oh, very, very simple. Yeah. You know, if yeah. you can't pass the ball from A to B um, with the correct technique, you know, you, you can't play the game. So you can't catch the ball, et cetera, et cetera. So, just one point I just wanted to make. Um, it is very, very interesting that, um, you know, the, even, you know, I'm talking about generations ago. Um, we One thing we're all in agreement in, in as coaches in the UK is that we need more court time and we need, to, you know, we need to play more. And, yeah. you know, we, we talk, we, you know, how many times have we talked about player X and we are, he's only getting two sessions a week, you know, of two hours. Well, you know, when I grew up, um, you know, with, and, and most of the players around me, and that's the Andrew Bailey's and the Ronnie and uh, Steady's, the Andy Gardner's, you know, that's my, you know, these are my players from my local area. Um, our school, were, we were practicing um, at 7 a.m., 7 to 8, you know, 8.15, and then getting changed and then going to class. At, at break time, break time, we were allowed in. The balls were just rolling around, and we'd go in there and we'd shoot for 15 minutes. That's in yeah. the morning and in the afternoon. And then we'd have afternoon practice, and sometimes we'd have lunch practice. And so people wonder – how you can become a better basketball player, you know, simply putting the ball in the hands of a, of a younger player, you know, and giving them those repetitions is, is something that, you know, I think we're missing, we've missed the point on uh, for a long while in this country and, you know, that access yeah. to the play. Let's talk though. Um, sorry to digress like that. Um, yeah. but this is, this is the main part of the, the podcast. It's now, you know, this skill development. So we, you know, you start, realizing um that you know the fundamentals of the game and not being um taught uh, to the to the level and the degree that you have been you've experienced that you've seen um you're interested about you know the mechanics of that you know talk to me a little bit about that and how how that whole process played out and what what how many what, what time what was the time frame at this moment as well yeah so i'd say 2008 was when was when right okay 
I, had, I now have a small group of kids and I need to improve their skills, right? So it was less of like, okay, let me just, you know, in the practice plan, let me just block in, you know, 10 to 15 minutes or this segment on this. Now it's like, actually my team practice is, that's it, it's team practice. Like we're working on, you know, the offense, the defense, like that's it. We're not touching skills. We're not doing it, right? I had to be smart with my planning. So when I saw them during the day, I was like, right, we're nailing, we're nailing this. And I was like, and it really, it challenged me because, you know, I'm not just now planning for, you know, seven minute ball handling drill. Now I'm like, okay, I've got an hour with them. And that's all we're going to do is hammer down the most important skills. So, um, and, and, and I was regularly talking to my um, high school coach. Um, they had just won like back-to-back -back state championships so, you know, I, I was, I was eager to learn like what, what's he doing, blah, blah, blah. And um, so he, he taught me a bunch, you know, and um, I actually took um, you know, Dwayne's generation. I took that year group, um, I took 10 kids back to my, my high school. Um, so we got to, you know, they got to go to school for a couple of days, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm coming off the subject here, but I, I was forced to learn more about how, how, how I can develop these skills and and that's where I realized and, and I and I experimented right so my early philosophy of skill development was very Mickey Mouse it was very look at me look how I can make something really exciting right. to for you to watch for you to be you know um, razzle dazzled with you know like if you look at this you'll think that you're getting something out of it sure. you know so I'd have players dribbling two balls I'd have speed ladders you know on the floor I'd, they'd be doing all kinds of things at once you know tennis balls you know all kinds of stuff but it, that was about me yeah that was about me that was about me showing off right. and 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 I couldn't I couldn't justify to myself I couldn't justify how that was helping them in any way right. you know and and that's when and, and and that's when I really started to be a reflective practitioner and ask what am I doing? Why am I doing that? Mm. Like, why am I, why am I doing this drill? And, and go on. You gotta, uh, yeah, no, I, that's a really great point. I mean, um, as, as coaches, um, I, I mean, I've always, uh, unfortunately I, 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 I do understand exactly that, 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 you know, kind of feeling that you're talking about, you know, I, I've, I've seen it I mainly have seen it in camp situations. Hey, we're going to run this drill because it looks great. Um, yeah. but like you say, there might not be a, what's, what is the full outcome when I was, you know, coaching, um, younger players though, I always felt the, um, there, there had to be a drill, um, if we were going to do a drill or some sort of competitive situation, I wanted a, an understanding of an outcome, you know, that there was going to be an outcome out of it. And that's why I always, um, even at that time, we're looking at drills that combine two skills um, because we didn't have much, we didn't have the time in the UK at that time to, you know, to fully bed in, you know, a lot of the skills. So if we were able to do a combination dribble pass drill or, you know, dribble pass shoot drill, I felt that there was, there, there was real validity with that, but I do understand exactly what you're saying, but our biggest problem with, in my view, with the, with the coaching and understanding what you're talking about there is not so much that you saw and, and, and felt that, um, but I see coaches that don't. Um, yeah. I see coaches that go on YouTube and see a bunch of drills, and, but have no context and understanding, or sorry, understanding of what the context of that drill is and what is the outcomes, or to see how the the player will progress with those drills. So I think that that's a really important point about the reflection. But it's great, great, great to see that you were doing that at a younger age. Yeah, I mean, and I think it was. Yeah, it just, and I, I can't even, there was no like one moment, but all of a sudden it did just click. And then, and I got rid of the ropes. I, you know, I got rid of the heavy ropes. I got rid of the speed ladders. I got rid of the two balls. And I was like, I was like, nah, I need to find out a way where we're going to improve the moments that, that you're going to experience in the game. Because that's how you build confidence, right? You build confidence through experiencing it, yeah. you know, before, you know? So, I needed to know, I, I needed my players to, if they, if it, if it was handling pressure, we need to create an environment where they're being pressurized every single day mm. so that they become confident and experienced with it. You know? So I didn't see how um, two ball drills 
or a ball, a basketball and a tennis ball was going to help my guys handle pressure, handle a, a, a full court man to man, handle a half court trap. I just couldn't see it. Right. And um, so I was like, right, I need to tweak this. I need to tweak it quick. Yeah. And then and did you, did you, were you reaching out to someone with these discussions, these thoughts, or were you putting this, was this all in your own mind? So this kind of grew organically. Like it definitely came from myself, but at the same time, who am I seeing on, on, on YouTube? I'm seeing Drew Hanlon of Pure Sweat. And I'm like, I like this guy, you know, I'm like, I'm like, we're aligned like I'm with you, like I, I, I get it, like, uh, and, I'm, and I'm looking at what he's doing, I'm like, yes, I'm, I'm taking that, I'm taking that, so I reached out to him, I reached out to him, and, what and year, I asked him, what, what year was this? This would have been 2015, no, uh, yeah, 2014, 2014, right. 2015, um, so his early stages, right. um, with Pure Sweat, so no one had really heard about him, um, but I saw his videos and I was like, love it. Absolutely love it. So I reached out to him and I asked him what now I know is a foolish question. It was a stupid question. I said, I, I emailed Drew and I was like, Drew, how can I w- get to work with NBA players? <laughs> you know, that was it. Like, I, because you know what? And I'll tell you why I asked that question because I, I had, and you know, to give you context of the time, I was putting videos up on YouTube and I was getting a lot of success, a lot of feedback and and started working with pro guys over here. Sure. Right? So my first guys that I was working with was like Jamel Anderson at Riders Now. Um, Ashley Hamilton was at um, Loyola Marymount in LA. Um, Teo Ogadengbi um, was at the time he was with, well, he was in Surrey. Yeah, he was uh, in Surrey. Yeah. I know he'd moved around yeah. since I'd been working with him, but he was in Surrey at the time. Um, so those are my three guys. Yeah. Those are my, those, that was my, my starting point. And then uh, Will Ohurabi um, was, 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 was a big time client of mine, um, you know, played in Belgium um, and, uh, and then obviously ended up playing, um, well, you were with him at the Royals, weren't you, for a yeah. moment? Um, so, you know, I would say those were my four then. Those were my four like, right. first clients. So I started to see that I can add value to a professional's career. Sure. So now I'm aligning my career with, with Drew Hanlon and I'm like, right, how can I work in the NBA? How can I work <laughs> yeah. NBA guys, you know? Sure. So his response was, you got to make them, yeah. you know? And it was that, and it was that moment when I was like, you're damn right. Yeah. You know what? Stop trying to, stop trying to jump. Like where you are, make the best of where you are right now and right. take whatever players you've got around you, get them to the highest freaking level that you can, you know? And, and again, we're talking about an era of D'Lo, you know, Dwayne yeah. Lotte, Ogunle, you know, we're talking about yeah. this era, Nelson's, yeah. Kings, Sessions. Um, and that's why I was like, I was all in. I was like, right, let me let me help get these guys to the next level like I've never done before. So this is, you know, the crux of, you know, your philosophy. I'm assuming mm, the more you start speaking to Drew, you know, your philosophy starts changing, um, yeah. you know, on the teaching of the, of the fundamental skills without going into minute detail. Let's talk about some of the, the real kind of like, wow, like, the, 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 you know, the wow moments. Because I had a, I even had a couple of wow moments when I watched you, you know, at a clinic. You know, I was like, wow, that's something that I'd never seen taught before, you know, in a certain way. Um, so what were, what were those kind of wow moments to you or, or of a certain skill? And you were like, you know, that's, I've, I wasn't taught like that. And, you know, what, and you could see a context and you could see why it was being taught in a certain way and the actual benefit. I think, I think, I think that was it. It was the way Drew was able to communicate the context. He was able to communicate why, why I'm doing this, why I'm teaching this. And, and, and that's when it started to make sense. So here's a move that you can do when you're going against taller defenders, right? You're trying to finish against a taller, more athletic defender. And I was like, I was like, yeah, like I'm trying to think of, I'm trying to think of, you know, my playing experience, my early coaching experience. I was like, yeah, I've never taught a player how to do that no. to the detail, you no. know? Um, you know, if I think about the early days, you know, it's like, you know, right-handed layup left-handed layup, reverse layup, yeah. power layup, yeah. right? But to specifically, here is how you finish against a taller defender. I was like, ah, right. now I need to be prepared for every single scenario that happens in a game. 
Now, okay, you can argue that you're never going to experience the same situation twice. No. Right? Like you're never going to stand in the same river twice. No. Right? Right? So I get that. However, you are going to meet a big, like if you're a guard, you're going to meet a bigger player at the rim. Sure. You know, you're going you're gonna to have a gap defender come over and reach. Yeah. And they're either going to reach high, mid or low. Yeah. Like, you know, you're going to experience the same, you know, the same situation, so to speak. So I was like, right, I need to get my guys familiar with the moments that they're going to experience the most in a game. Right. So, so that was the first wow. Um, the second wow was when I actually worked for Drew. So I joined his Pure Sweat organization and worked for him and spent a few summers in LA with him um, uh, you know, for, 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 for 10 days where we're literally, I'm with him, I'm with him all the time, yeah. you know, and, um, and, and the wow was what, what on earth was happening? Like, what am I witnessing here? I'm witnessing, you know, the, the, the best players in the world go to work, you know, and it was nothing that I've ever seen before. So we're talking about the, 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 the amount of, um, you know, repetitions on shooting, but we're not just talking about stand still, catch and shoot. We're not just talking about that. We're talking about, again, scenarios that they're going to see, you know, whether it be the corner drifts, whether it be the wing lifts, whether it be the transition threes, you name it. Like if that player is going to see it and he, I mean, he's got a load of players, right? Like sure. yeah, you know, he's not yeah. going to give every single player the same thing, oh. which again was another wow moment. It was about, you need to, you need to know your clients. You need right. to know your players. You need to know where they get their touches and, and make them great at, the, at, the, at those moments. Right. So, um, so I saw that. And then I saw some of the, the, the details that he was teaching, um, which again, you know, the hand swipes, the bumps. I mean, it just wasn't, I hadn't seen it being taught before. No, definitely. And not. now I'm understanding why it's so important to teach it. Yeah. Um, so I then I mean, came back from, from my first summer in LA and I was like, right, that's it. Transformation transformation you know i'm gonna make you know not only am i gonna you know raise the level of these younger players i'm working with but now i'm gonna really help these pros get to better contracts sure you know and 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 am i right in saying um i mean firstly i mean just the stance you know which you you know you talk about you know where you know how to start how 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 you're catching the ball you know all of these details especially especially stance you know in 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 how it was being just taught traditionally you know to now where it's been taught at an elite level um to be to be able to attack you know with that speed and you know attacking certain certain angles certain certain footwork of the defense um which i found was was fascinating what you were doing but i think that um, and and this is the point I want to try to get across to the younger coaches. What I'm talking about, and I hope that you would you would agree, or you're going to back it up on it, is that um, you can watch the Drew Hanlon videos, um, but you know until you're in that environment and you're seeing you know hours and hours of repetition, you know particularly of a certain skill or certain drills, you know you're not picking up even the, you know the other nuances of of that skill development. Am I right in saying that? 100%. I mean, look, you know, you watch a, you watch a, you watch my video, you sure. watch Drew Hannon's video. I mean, you watch any tutorial video you want, right? You're only going to get a snapshot of what is really happening. You know, in that five minute video, you're seeing, you know, just to throw a random percentage out, you're seeing, you know, 40% of the detail, you know, the, the other 60% of the detail is either not being shown in the video has already been taught or is, has not been taught yet. Do you know what I mean? And, and that's why it's really important for coaches. I mean, we can, we can label younger coaches, but really I'm talking about any coach. Like if you want to develop, if you want to develop as a coach, like you need to be, you need to be out there experiencing things regularly, like a one-off clinic or coaching course, isn't going to, isn't going to all of a sudden sprinkle this magical dust on you. And now you've got it, you know, you, you just don't download it. No. And then you've got it. Like you've got to be, in it constantly asking questions like getting closer and closer asking why the hell are you doing that i mean when when you know in the summers in la like drew's got me involved you know i'm i'm either playing defense i'm rebounding or i'm or i'm just observing and i'm like walking up to him you know while he's like working with myers leonard and i'm and i'm saying why are you doing that 
Mm. And he's telling me why, you know? And if I just watched that on the video, I wouldn't know why, No. you know? So, so like, you've got to ask questions, you know, you've got to invest time and energy and yet yeah, money mm. to, to, to improve as a coach. Like, there's there's no there's no shortcut to this. No, there isn't. A you know, there's an, there's an investment that's needed. So, uh, just I just want to go back to this whole um, uh, uh, point you just started talking about. So let's take um, let's take an Ovi Soko for example. You know, another you know really did you know you know one of the highest level players that we produced in the last number of years. Um, talk to me about how you went about working with him because you said that you you know you need to get to know the client, the player. Um, you know, are you? you know, talking to them, you know, you're watching game tape, do you watch game tape with them? Um, and then do you need to, do you, you know, how do you start to develop like a, a plan? You know, what, what, what's, what's that process look like, you know, in a kind of a smallish way, uh, you know, small time way? Yeah. Um, I mean, I'll give you two contrasting ways that I've done it actually with two high level players. So let's talk Ovi, for example. So I started working with Ovi in 2017 um, he was back. This was just after um, he was with Mercia um, in the ACB, and um, you know he he wanted he wanted to. I mean, Ovi, look, Ovi's one of the most professional players I've worked with. You know, on court, off court. I mean, this guy is like he's so switched on. You know, it is unbelievable how switched on he is. So you know, he he likes to isolate himself. And he's like, no, you know, no distractions. I'm like, right, I'm going to, I'm going to go and work on my craft and I'm going to be a better player this summer. Mm. So, so, so we connected um, and, um, and just went to work. Now I, I did my background check. I was like, right, well, I need to know. I mean, obviously I knew who Ovi was. I remember Ovi as a 15 year old walking into Harrow High actually to one of my camp. So, you know, I, I, you know, Ovi wasn't a new name for me. No. Um, but I needed to understand context. I needed to understand, okay, well, you know, okay, six foot eight athlete, but where does he, where does he play? Like, you yeah. know, and most of the time he's in like the low and mid post, sure. you know, that's a, a lot of his touches are in that kind of elbow mid post area. So I started to look at those moments and see, okay, well, you know, where are his turnovers now? Um, very privileged to have access to synergy, which allowed me yeah to filter those things, you know, so it's a lot quicker. So I can, I can, I can see these moments and I'm seeing where the turnovers are happening. I'm seeing where, okay, we could tweak this a little bit. We could change the angle of how he's catching it in the mid post mm. um, to make a baseline spin a lot easier, you know, those kind of things. Sure. Um, and I'm, it's, it, it's about reverse engineering it. You see, Tony, if it was about me, right. I would have got, I would have got Ovi in the gym and rolled out the tennis balls Right, yeah. and rolled, you know, and rolled out two balls and got him doing all this cra crazy stuff. Got yeah. the pads out, made it look good on video. Yeah. But the truth is, right, this guy needs to be more efficient in the mid post, and he needs to shoot better from outside the three. Absolutely, yeah. Like he's already a killer, but there's still room to improve. Yeah. Absolutely. So I was like, I need to help this guy in areas that matter him the most. I mean, we're talking about a guy that's playing in arguably the second best league in the world. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. He's he's not going to waste his time with me. I don't want to waste his time, you no. know? So I have to make this incredibly purposeful. So every second we have together, I'm like, this is why you're doing it. Right. You know? And he saw the value in that immediately. So it became a thing now. So um, obviously he's going back to Spain. Um, so this is my first experience of like virtual coaching, if you like. So I'm, you know, like after like three or four games, I'm, I'm having a look, I'm sending him, you know, uh, an edited version of like, oh, look, you're doing this really well. You know, oh, look, actually, look where you're getting your touches. You know, let's 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 think about how we can tweak this a little bit. So this dialogue is now ongoing, and I'm understanding Ovi more and more and more and more and more. So now the next summer, it's like, right, let's really really get to work. Yeah. You know? um, did you? By the way, who, um, did you tweak his shot? Semi reconstruct his shot? Or, you know, yeah. because obviously his, his three point percentage has gone up and um, you probably added at least $50,000 to his contracts now, you know, <laughs> by, by doing that, um, because that obviously was his week, you know, was, you know, if you're shooting, 
27% from the three point line, you know, as a, as a stretch four, and then suddenly you can get it up to 37, 39, you know, which is, you know, a guard, you have to guard that player 27, you're, you're closing short and you're taking away all these driving angles um, from the three point line. He makes one of four. It's one of four. Now, you know, he's three of six. I mean, four of seven, you know, that's, you got to close to that shot and then he just drives by you. So did yeah. you, ch- did you tweet that? I'm just asking that as a question a little bit. Yeah. Without a doubt, I mean, one of the early conversations was about was about his shooting form. Like, I was like, I was like, Ovi, like, you know, you're 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 shooting the ball straight at the rim, you know, like there's no arc in it, right? And and the crazy thing is, is like what I started to learn from working with loads and loads of players on at this kind of level, not level as in playing level, but this level of detail, was that you can tell a player all you want that you need to shoot higher, you need a higher arc. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's, you know, message sent doesn't equal message received <laughs> a lot of the time, you yeah. know? So we got to find a way of, of getting the player to own that a little bit more. So for me, that's when I was, I started to be getting really skilled on the details of shooting and not just the, you need to shoot higher, you need a higher arc, but what is it that's causing the flat shot? Mm. You know, what is it? Um, you know, and we won't go into the, those kind of details now because otherwise we'd be on it for three hours but yeah but but it was very clear from the footage i could see why he was shooting flat right and he wasn't necessarily aware of that right right? so those were the early conversations it was like how what we need to identify those flaws in your mechanics so that in the off season all right that's when we're really going to nail it so 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 the journey began you know Mm. and when you know after he did love island um, and, and obviously that period of time meant that he was practicing less. Sure. Um, it meant that when he came out, I mean, literally the day he came out of that show, you know, I messaged him. I was like, let me know when you're ready. And he was like, I'm ready. Right. You know, so that's it. Like we're, we're going, we're, we're grinding from, from that day. And, um, and it was like, no gimmicks, no moves, no nothing. Like we're going to, we're going to sort out your shot right. now. It's not, but we're not talking about an overnight thing. No. You know, we're not even talking about a week, two weeks. Like, let's be really, really transparent here. That it takes a lot of time to 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 fix things that you've been doing inefficiently for such a long period of time. Sure. So, so all of a sudden, his shooting percentage <clears throat> started to go a little bit further down. So now the mental aspect is starting to play on his mind. You know, and and we've got to remain patient with each other. That don't worry these these concepts these principles are going to add value in the end yeah. we've just got to now undo it you know a little bit um and then all of a sudden it started to go back up and and his confidence starts to go back up as well and yeah for sure like this season you know he's been he's been shooting very very well um you said you had the second player um i'm conscious of the time but uh yeah, yeah. what was the second oh. example um of of a different way that you've gone about developing a player yeah so and not, so this player, I wanted to work with this player, um, Kevin Serafin, right? So Kevin Serafin, for those who don't know, we're talking about an NBA player, right? NBA, like seven or eight years, Indiana, Washington, you name it, right? So he happened to be, um, he left the NBA, now he's playing in Barcelona. Um, so I got connected to Kevin through Benny Bonsu, actually. And, and, and I said to Kevin, I was like, look, Kevin, for this whole year, right? I'm, I'm, I'm going to just send you my thoughts and some breakdowns, right? I don't want anything from you, right? I don't want nothing from you. I just want, I just want you to, to watch it, right? And let me know if, if that's helpful at all. Um, and you know what? Cut a long story short, he valued, he valued my, my feedback and evaluation so strongly that he took, you know, he, he was like, right, I'm bringing you over to Barcelona. So, right. you know, he flew me over to Barcelona and, you know, I, I get to stay with Kevin for a while to learn a bit more about him. And, and now the conversations are getting a bit more detailed and we're looking at his post game, you know, right. and how we can improve his efficiency in the post. Sure. And he's like, he's like, Gary, like, you know, I've had this coach, this trainer, and nobody's ever broken it down like this, right. you know, for me before. Awesome. So, massive confidence boost for me because I'm like, hold on a minute. We've got an NBA level guy here yeah. who's, who's paying me some serious compliments. Yeah. Um, so that, that, that was it. I was like, right, I'm going to keep going with this. Like, right. 
you know, I'm going to keep preaching it because I'm clearly onto something that's really helping high level players that I can now share with players at a younger age and accelerate their, their learning. Yeah. That's, that's an awesome story there. Um, so let's bring this into the context now of, um, of British basketball. Um, I've said to you off air a little bit about, you know, what, I know obviously what you had done and even if I hadn't coached you at a young age and didn't have a personal relationship with you um, I would have still known about you and what you do but you talk to me about how like um, what you've done is perceived in 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 British basketball coaching um, if other coaches do do a lot of the academy coaches reach out to you um, younger coaches talk to you about you know developing a specific skill and 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 do you think that you know the fact that you know again our game is just not professional enough that this this role as a as a high level skill skills coach whatever way you want to term that um is almost underappreciated and almost not valued here in this country yeah really really good question and it's not a straightforward answer i think i mean let me take the early part of your question right and yes i have i have a, a very strong relationship with with a lot of the academy coaches um with professional coaches now uh, because I'm dealing a lot more now with, with sure. professional right. clients too. So for sure, my my network, if you like, um, has expanded and that dialogue is very open about certain players, about certain skills. Um, I'd say at that level, they're they're not they're reaching out more about players rather than the coaching, yeah. Rather yeah. than my coaching. Sure. Um, yeah. which is interesting, but might highlight that maybe they don't really know what I'm doing, um, you know, or how I could add value. I mean, there are some, I'm talking very general here. Yeah. Um, um, but yes, younger coaches do reach out to me. I've had, you know, some coaches from all over the country who have traveled, you know, in the summer to, to come and like stay at a hotel or stay at a family member's house. And they just want to like be around yeah. Yeah. You know, taking notes and learning so um so my experience is that there's a lot of you know young coaches um uh, or experienced coaches who who are very interested in it um but i think some some don't necessarily appreciate how it could actually fit in to their to their program maybe um there's various reasons i mean may, maybe maybe you know, maybe, maybe they think they know it all. I don't know. You know? Sure. There's yeah, going to yeah. be various, various reasons, but yeah. they definitely are, you know, I definitely do have strong contacts with, uh, with, with some of the academy coaches right. and pro coaches yeah, in this country. And uh, so then that second part of that question about this perception of, you know, this high level skills trainer and um, whatever, however you want to phrase that. I mean, some people talk about, you know, you know, player development, you know, I mean, in America, you would be kind of like player development or you would be a skills trainer. It's all kind of all in the same kind of ballpark. Um, I mean, you know, what's that perception here? Because of course, you know, the culture in our country is that we don't, you know, we, we don't pay people in our sport anyway. So now, you know, what, what, what's, what's your thought process with regards to that? I think the, the, the biggest problem with, skills training, skills coaching, skill development, right? Is that over here anyway, I mean, well, globally, there's no curriculum, no. right? There's, you know, there's no course, there's no, there's no accreditation. So now people, you know, it, it's really opened up now to, to, a, to, a, to dialogue is like, well, what is good skills training? What is good skills coaching? What's, you know, what's the, the, the issue is, is that the truth is, the perception of skills coaches is dribbling right <laughs> you know like dribbling like com you know dribble combos um you know these you know fancy moves you know uh, uh, you know 50 cones out in a half a court you know that's that unfortunately that is the the image that you get from mm -hmm. these from skills coaches um so i think this the the market is very saturated um, and the higher level skills coaches, we're talking about a minority yeah. um, that are either, you know, difficult to reach out to. Sure. So maybe they're in the US 
um, or there just aren't many of them for sure in the UK. Right. Right. You know, um, so I think I think that's a big problem with the perception of what skills training actually means. Um, oh, that's good. 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 It was really good stuff. A slight follow up, a little bit slightly different change of direction. But um, the game is just it really has radically changed in the, you know, in the past, you know, three to five years. I mean, yeah, changed you know five to ten years ago and then now it's changing you know incredibly i mean and everything is obviously nba dominated but even when you watch euro league and any type of high level european basketball you just see the the the, the skill sets of the players have changed um the skill of the players is you know is just continuing to get better shooting is you know is you know it was always the biggest issue anyway you know and now it's even more so um, do you feel that here in the UK, we're still, you know, just so far away from understanding, you know, where the game is internationally and what it takes for a player to get to that level? You know, we're still teaching players in a certain way. You know, does that worry you? And, you know, what what are your thoughts on that? It's a It's a massive concern, like for sure. I mean, but, you know, I did it right when I was a younger coach how you know ask me how I coached I coached like you coached me I coached like you know Joe coached me I coached you know I just I just took the best bits you know from how I was coached sure. but the issue is is that I'm taking it that was like 10 years ago yeah exactly. you know and while I loved it 10 years ago yeah. you know that it's unfortunately it's not necessarily relevant or or efficient enough now you know, and I think, you know, some coaches are still coaching the way that they've been coaching for 10 years, that they learned how to coach from 10 years before that, you know, um, and maybe it's because access to the higher quality. I mean, look, you know, you can get any, I mean, we've spoken about this before, you can get literally anything you want on the internet now, sure. right, which is super amazing. But at the same time, it's incredibly overwhelming. Yeah. Like, how do you differentiate between what's good and what's absolute trash? Sometimes it's very difficult, especially if you don't know. Yeah. Well, yeah. You don't know what you don't know, right? So, you know, and, and, I've, and I've learned about these things through, you know, spending my time with, like, Drew Hanlon. So I know, you know, what works compared to what doesn't work, if you like, right? And um, so I think it's that awareness thing of, of how do we... How do we how do we upskill how do we upskill skills trainers skills coaches how do we get um, you know team coaches maybe liaising with these skills guys so that together we kind of like you know grow, like yeah. raise the level here yeah, you know it, it, is, it, is, it is a concern I mean I see the way some people teach shooting and I'm like you know I mean don't get me wrong everything is philosophical right like there's no right or wrong you know it's my way your way whatever but i'm looking at like look i'm basing mine on objective objective you know statistics like feedback yeah. right like yeah. you know like if someone says to me if someone says to me oh you know um you need to shoot with 10 toes you know facing the basket right, right? then what i'm i'm gonna i'm gonna challenge that and i'm gonna look at the data and say well hold on a minute it doesn't really matter where your feet point as long as you don't rotate when you jump like yeah. it's the twist that matters not necessarily where your feet are right, right. And, 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 it, and it's things like that so i started to really um you know study the reasons why yeah um, i was challenge, challenging my thinking tra challenging well, the status quo and i and i wanted to just finish up this 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 talk on the actual skills development side with the shooting um i mean what's your um kind of thought process and, and and have you actually thought about something that could really radically change um our mindset you know on shooting in this country because we whatever way we want to look at it i mean the game now i mean i'm seeing uh, you know i i'll I give you an example um you know i i tuned in to watch minnesota play um new orleans last week to see chris's first chris chris finch's first win um and i'll be honest with you i i didn't know four of those guys that were on his team and they're shooting the lights out 
um and you know these these were like kind of guys that have been really successful college and g league players that you know are now in the league yeah they're yeah. good players but they're not the named players and these guys are shooting the lights out and what i keep just coming back to is you know you know in europe um the difference between you know a team like the lithuanian team that played vince's team you know london lions is they can shoot the ball from the outside and we can't um how are we going to change that what's uh what needs to change you know in basketball in the uk for us to learn to shoot the ball better i mean mechanically for sure is one way um we've got a hell of a lot of broken shots in this country and there's not enough people that know how to fix that you know they just don't know how to identify what's going what's going wrong and this is and this is where i would i mean i would love to add value on a on a on a bigger scale because i would love someone to just trust to trust me that the environment that i've been in the 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 coaching and the players that i've seen firsthand i've seen you know drew hannon fix markel fultz's shot you know i've i've seen how he develops jason tatum and bradley bill you know, and, and I just and I, I, I want people to trust me that the journey that I'm, I'm willing to take them on is going to, without a doubt, you know, lead to some really positive results. So I think I think we need to reach out to people who certainly do this on a daily basis. Right. Like study the art of shooting, you know, like I study, it. you know, like I can literally look at a shot and see the details of the fingers, the hands. Um, you know, the elbows, the knees, that, you know, it, everything, I, I see it. And really what I'm asking myself is, hold on a minute, like, what's the problem with the shot? Either it's not swishing, therefore it's not going high enough, or it's going left or right. Like, really, those are the two things, do you know what I mean? And so I'm like, okay, well, what's, what's not causing it to go straight? Or what's not allowing it to get the, the loop, the arc for the swish? Yeah. So I'm looking at every little you know, joint and movement to figure out what is it that's impacting that shot. And that's how I see it. I, I reverse engineer the shot and say, okay, well, he's not twisting big plus right on his jump. So now let's look up, right. And let's see now, you know, I'm not big on the elbow straight thing anymore. I think that's kind of wasted information if I'm honest, right, okay. um, you know, so for me, it's like, we need that ball flying straight. So, you know, if the elbows out, and that player is able to get it consistently straight, but no arc. Well, now we need to look at, okay, well, what's causing that ball to go flat rather than up, you know? So it's like, let's not try and, um, you know, make every player shoot the same because that's never going to happen. Never. No. You know, I mean, take two of the greatest shooters arguably in the world right now in history. We've got Steph Curry and Clay Thompson, but they look completely different when they shoot, yeah. right? So, but they've got similar uh you know concepts set and similar characteristics that that shot has the high arc and certainly goes straight yeah. so how can we make players shot do that well we need to look at the details and we need to be aware of that and i don't think many people are because the the details are so small i didn't even i wasn't even aware that they existed you yeah. know like like beef you know like yeah. these acronyms that we've used like yeah. that's that's not it there's a lot more to it and I think, you know, we need to have that dialogue with coaches, whether it be myself or, or others from around the world, have that dialogue, you know, with them to find out what is the best way to get a player more efficient from shooting behind the three. Because it's, it's huge. Yeah. It's, it's huge. You know, without that. Right. Okay, Gary. I, I mean, there's some unbelievable, there's some great stuff in there, the, the, that whole period. Let's get this finishes up with uh, um, three quick questions. Um, <laughs> Uh, favorite uh, basketball coach of all time. Oh man, in Prez's company, Tony. Like you can't ask that question. I mean, yeah. uh, uh, okay, quick fire. Let me say so. Uh, I'll say Drew Hanlon. Drew Hanlon, yeah, awesome. Um, uh, favorite basketball drill at this moment. You got a thousand drills, but what's yeah. the one that you love love more than anything at this moment? Oh, tough. I, t I tell you, I. T I you know what? I'm I'm less on drills and more on concepts these days. Right. Okay. However, Good. however, what I love the setup that I love in order to get players finishing at the rim with contact is like the blind start where you've got um uh you know the defender is standing on the three point line facing the hoop, and then the attacker is behind them with the ball on the back, and as a starting position they could go either way, and then it's one on one, 
it gets the player, the defender on the hip. Yeah. And 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 that's such a common theme when players are driving to the basket. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that love gets them into the details love that we talk about. So if yeah. you're if you're telling me about a drill, I love setting that up okay. as, a, as, love, as a drill. Love that. And then lastly, uh, a, uh, a go-to phrase that you use a lot in your coaching. <laughs> Do you know what? I asked my son that, right? Because I reckon my... <laughs> I reckon my, you know, my, my children are probably around me the most, you know, on court, off court. And um, I, I mean, he couldn't come up with one, but he said, he said, dad, you know, whenever you're like showing a move, you always like make a sound effect when you do it. You know, like, you know, when you, when you do a bump, you go, boom, you know, you, 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 you add in that. So I'm afraid that's my contribution to that. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Awesome stuff. Great. Well, listen, uh, Gary, listen, we could talk for hours. Um, you know, you know that um, from my perspective, you know, I've, I've said that, you know, I wish that, you know, our, our, you know, whoever it would be, the, the Great Britain set up, the national team set up, EB, BE, sorry, um, would would have you involved in such a bigger role as a, you know, as a skills development or as, a, you know, as a shooting, you know, coach to, to a number of players and coaches. And I hope that eventually that is going to happen to you, you know, for you, because as a nation, we absolutely need you. And um, I know that you're going to go on to so many great things. Um, this is only the start. And um, I really appreciate you um, being on the podcast tonight. Oh, thank you, Tony. Like, this is, I mean, look, you know, if there's a podcast I'm going to enjoy the most, it's definitely going to be this one with you. So I really appreciate, you know, you having me on it. Appreciate that. Thank you, Gary.